Now, the ongoing COP27 summit holding in Egypt is the biggest gathering of world leaders, multilateral agencies, leading institutions, companies and activists discussing one of the biggest issues the world faces at the moment, the climate. Our ICE environment correspondent Leila Johnson Salami is here to summarize the first week of the UN Climate Summit for us. Thanks for attending in tonight. Of course, it's, Mr. Isn't it a very busy week? A very busy week indeed. Yeah, whether, whether you're on the ground or you're monitoring <laughs> off the, off the yeah. ground, COP27 is as big as it can get. That's it. There's no climate conference or climate event in the world that's bigger than this. Uh, and the biggest and the biggest men and women there we go. Uh, are in the room. Over Let's start like with Joe Biden's uh, sure. address just about an hour or two ago, announcing half a billion dollars for Egypt. That's, uh, I think that's some good news. Certainly. I mean, it's good news for Egypt. Uh, President Joe Biden announced $500 million in clean energy funding support for Egypt. This is in partnership with the EU and Germany as well. Now, the package is going to enable Egypt to deploy 10 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. And according to Biden, because of this agreement, Egypt has actually been able to update its, um, its climate ambition through its nationally determined contributions. Now, these are the contributions contributions that member states of the UN submit to the um, to the UNFCC every, every very often actually it has to always be updated because it's legally binding to say so so based on this agreement Egypt can now update their NDCs which is good news not just for Egypt if that is happening but for the world uh, President Biden also spoke on how the climate crisis is about human and economic security, uh, which of course we know he doesn't have much time in Egypt as he is off to Asia for the G20 and other summits. So, uh, yeah, he's making the most of the little time that he's got here. The G20 is another big one for Africa. Because most likely Africa will join the G20. Certainly. That's going to be, it's good. and that's just in three weeks' time, so or it's, two it's, weeks' it's time. Big, it's big news. So, very big news. We'll wait very, and see very, what happens. Very big there. news. Mm -hmm. but, but, but do you think, what have you seen in terms of hosting of this event so far by Egypt, in terms of the organization and all of that. I look at the website and the program of event is so swampy, it's like yeah. diving into the ocean. It is actually like diving into the ocean. There's so much to get into, so yes. many different thematic days, news coming out literally every second. Uh, the conference does seem well organized so mm -hmm. far. This is obviously considering the fact that there were worries ahead of the conference um, based on human rights violations in Egypt and issues with regards to that, the crackdown on protests mm -hmm. in Egypt as well and issues with regards to that. But protesters seem to have been protesting outside the venue, demonstrating peacefully um, with no interruptions. There have been several different protests going on. Definitely not as much as Glasgow last year when 10,000 activists took to the streets. Oh, yeah. yeah, but Sharm el Glasgow Sheikh, was, a diff was a different. <laughs> Glasgow was completely different. I mean, I was there and even just trying to move down the streets was pretty much impossible because mm -hmm. of the protests. Uh, but from what I hear from journalists who are on the ground, it's a lot quieter this year than it was in Glasgow, which is interesting considering this was supposed to be the largest cop yet. Uh, also an African cop. So it's interesting to note that it's not as busy as Glasgow was, I hear. But obviously, 50,000 attendees, over 120 world leaders. Mr. Boerson, still pretty busy, if no, you it's, ask it's, me. It's, it's big. If, you can, yeah. if any country on the continent can pull 50,000 people together at this point in time, more than 100 world leaders, that's no, that's not a small, uh, a mean feat, by the way. Uh, we yeah. need to give that to uh, President El Sisi and, uh, and his team. But, but would you say that Africa is getting the right attention in discussions on climate financing deals so far uh, in the week? Have we heard from the president? Yes, you mentioned uh, just one or two. But again, what about key African institutions such as the FDB, the African Union, the Africa 50, and a few other partners who are willing to sit down with us and say, look, this is Africa's moment in the sun. Let's give yeah. it to them. Certainly. I mean, the Africa Development Bank has been very involved, as we've seen this week. We've had the launch of the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative, the launch of another initiative for green infrastructure in Africa. But the thing is, Mr. Boerson, this is an African COP, right? So you would want as much focus on Africa as possible. And the entire idea being led by the COP27 presidency of shifting from pledges to action is important for Africa. But we have to be realistic with what we're seeing here. The $100 billion in annual climate 
finance has never been met. So until it is, it's actually difficult to say that Africa is getting the right kind of attention because climate justice still seems a bit hard for Africa to achieve. And there's also no detail on an undertaking to double adaptation, funding for adaptation, uh, financing by 2025 at COP26. That was a pact that was made or included in the Glasgow Climate Pact to double financing for adaptation by 2025. One week into COP, we haven't seen much with regards to an undertaking for that. And if we want to accelerate Africa's transition, if we want to bring Africa out of the climate crisis and adjust and adapt to what we're seeing, then we have to see progress with regards to the things that I've mentioned. And yes, we've seen some progress in terms of more pledges and more monetary commitments, etc. But when it comes to the nitty gritty of how we're going to do this, what the undertaking looks like, we definitely want to see more of that in week two. And the onus is on African negotiators to ensure that they push for that because we don't want this to be another situation where at COP28 next year in Dubai, we are literally speaking about the exact same things, which is what is happening now. The discussions that went on at COP26 are being repeated at COP27, because in the space of one year, not much has been achieved. But uh, I picked a few uh, soundbites from, from, from the ELDB president, yeah. uh, Dr. Kumi Adishina, and as much as he spoke to the developed and the biggest emitters in the world, he had a few words of... Um, of um, instructions, as it were, advice, whatever you call it, yeah. to African leaders. Because we can't just ask everyone to bring the money to the yes. table. We've got to do something at the home front. That's so it. So what are a few of those things that African presidents, heads of state and government on the continent need to do? That's a very good question, Mr. Boasen. A huge thing is obviously ensuring that when looking for funding for one's energy transition plan, you're also coming to the table with something. This is a point that Dr. Akimomi Adeshina has been pressing on for a few months, uh, pretty much since Rotterdam, when the Africa Acceleration Adaptation Program was launched. And he came forward saying that uh, Africa has a adaptation financing gap of about $41 billion. The AFDB are looking to raise $25 billion the AFDB will come forward with $12.5 billion, and now we're calling on wealthy nations and the largest polluters to come forward with the remaining 12.5. So one would have wanted to definitely see more of that this week. Maybe we will see more of that next week with African leaders stepping forward and saying, this is what we are going to do at the same time. Because right now it does seem more as though we, we are presenting these plans and saying, this is what we need. Where is the funding? We need the funding. Yes, we do need the funding. Yes, we don't need the funding to come with debt, but we also need to look inwards. For example, here in Nigeria, we're still one of the largest polluters in Africa, right? So we have to look at our own policies um, and how we are going to adapt to the climate crisis without always looking outwards. And yes, it's about climate justice and it's not charity to look to the largest polluters to pay up for the <laughs> pretty much the mess that they've created. But you have to have some answers at home as well. So hopefully we see more of that next week. I must admit, I didn't see enough of it this week. We, we, we need to do that. And, and I just pick it because sometimes he, uh, Dr. Additional, just inserts some of this in, in his uh, uh, very eloquent uh, speeches, Certainly. yes, about, look, we need policies. He, he spoke about a, a couple of issues um, um, Did you? that we need to, but, but I'm, I'm happy that Egypt is, um, is playing the good host for, for the rest of us so yes. far, uh, and, I, and I agree with that to him. But, uh, if you, what's the discussion? What do you think the discussions next week will, will look like? Would there be more of the repetitions of what has been said? Or is there something else that need to come on the table? We haven't heard so much specifically from the Nigerian team in terms of concrete. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you've heard anything. In terms of concrete actions for Nigeria, yeah. no, except for the pledge of 95 million pounds that the UK made to support us with climate resilient agriculture. Except for that, we've just gotten mm. quotes with regards to what members of the delegation have said with regards to adaptation, uh, carbon credits, etc. But it's nothing. Especially the Minister of the Environment. Yes, yes, we've gotten quite a few quotes from the Minister of Environment um, as well. But next week we have thematic days coming up on gender, water, energy, biodiversity, energy day. 
Day and Biodiversity Day, as you can imagine, are going to be huge days. In fact, all of them, Gender Day, Water Day. So you can also imagine that negotiations are obviously going to get more intense. It is the final week of COP. The second week is the final week. So people are going to start wrapping things up. Delegations are going to start putting forward their closing statements. Um, so it's going to be a very, uh, very busy week. But at the same time, that being said, there's probably going to be less presence in Egypt as more people leave. Um, you often find that there are less people around during the second week of COP. Um, so we'll expect it to be a tiny bit more quiet too. Um, but we'll be keeping track of what Nigeria is doing and Africa at large. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm beginning to feel uh, to ask, what do you think the, the, the basic um, um, tickets will be for Nigeria, the mm. baby steps that we can take from here now, instead of just doing the talk, you have election next year and all of that. Good, very good question. I think the minimum that Nigeria can walk out of here with is adequate funding for Nigeria's mm. energy transition plan. Mm. Um, Nigeria was initially looking for an initial $10 billion investment. This was actually ahead of COP. And at COP27, the environment minister announced that Nigeria would be seeking about $400 billion for its energy transition plan. So walking away with funding uh, the right partners in the private sector to support the NETP would be great for Nigeria. Um, but then there also needs to be more action in terms of biodiversity. Uh, we have a huge deforestation issue in Nigeria. Less than 10% of the country is forest today. We've witnessed how serious of an issue it is, even with the flooding in Nigeria, not having enough mangroves in the southern region of the country to soak up the effects of climate change. So climate resilient infrastructure, walking away with strong partnerships with the private sector is key for Nigeria. Hopefully we see more of that coming out over the weekend and next week. But for now, it is a bit quiet. Nigeria is sort of hiding under the guise of obviously initiatives that it's involved in, like the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative mm. and the support for the Africa yes. Union and AFDB initiatives. But we want to see more from Nigeria, certainly. We want to see that. Thank you so much. I'm sure go enjoy your weekend. Leila Jensen Salami, thank will. you so you much. Too, Mr. Our Environment Correspondent.